All right, so we will get started. I'd like to introduce myself. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Colin Whitfield from the University of Saskatchewan, and I am here today as a representative of the Biogeosciences Executive to help in moderating today's session. Um, we have a lineup of six talks. Uh, each talk will be about 12 minutes in length and opportunity for questions afterwards. So I thank our, our group of panelists today for persevering and, and putting together a talk uh, in this new format and also to Daryl and Dieter for being the behind the, si behind the scenes go-to to uh, help orchestrate this whole endeavor that's gonna, gonna move uh, forward over the course of the summer. So we have a session today. And then just a reminder that next week there will be a, a, another session that's on the 26th. Uh, and those talks will be uh, from various hydrology, uh, hydrology sessions that were planned for the original meeting. Um, so just as we get started, if you have a question um, to ask one of our panelists after their talk, you'll notice that on the bottom of your screen, uh, towards the, the right hand side um, of, the, of the buttons, there's a Q&A button there. So we'll ask you to use that to pose any questions you, that you might have. And then it'll be my job as moderator to help relay, relay, uh, excuse me, re relay those to our, to our speakers. So hopefully that makes sense. I know not everybody's familiar with Zoom, but, uh, but we'll figure it out together. And with that, I would uh, like to turn it over to our first speaker for, for today, Taylor Vidopia uh, from the University of Waterloo for her talk. So I'll ask you to share your screen, Taylor, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. My name is Taylor Vidopia. And I'm a master's student at the University of Waterloo. And today I'm going to be talking about effects of restoration methods on nutrient dynamics on a seismic line in a fen in Boreal, Alberta. I would like to start off by thanking my funding sources, as well as my supervisors, collaborators, and field partners for all their help as well as acknowledge that my project takes place within Treaty 6 and the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4. So my research is focused on the impact of seismic lines. In Alberta, we have over 345,000 kilometers of seismic lines that run through our peatlands. What are seismic lines? Well, seismic lines are created for oil and gas exploration. What happens is they remove the vegetation in order to bring seismic equipment onto the landscape. This seismic equipment sends vibrations down beneath the surface to detect whether there's natural resources like oil and gas. As you can see in this photo, seismic lines really fragment the landscape. Seismic lines began to be created in the early 1950s. And to this day, we see this impact on the landscape. This is because unlike other oil and gas activities, there's no regulations on restoring these seismic lines. That's because they thought they would naturally restore on their own. But we see 50, 60 years later that there's some vegetation that has a hard time reestablishing on these lines. When we look at the average percent cover of vegetation on the seismic lines that are on my site, we see that we do have a lot of sphagnum and other mosses, but we don't have a lot of trees and lichen. That's really detrimental to the caribou because these seismic lines act like corridors or highways that predators like wolves can easily see and chase their prey through. Also, lichen, a food source of the woodland caribou, likes to grow on dry surfaces like trees and rocks which are absent from these seismic lines. So what are the potential barriers to recovery of seismic lines? Why aren't we seeing these types of vegetation here? I believe it's because of, no of moisture regimes and nutrient regimes. A peatland has a natural microtopography of these elevated areas known as hummocks and these lower areas known as hollows. This microtopography forms microhabitats that allow different types of vegetation 
to flourish in the same ecosystem. When we create these seismic lines, we're getting rid of this microtopography. We're compacting the peat, which increases the water table, increasing the soil moisture. This is decreasing the aeration, microbial activity, decomposition, nutrient availability, and we see this decrease in biodiversity of vegetation. So it's important when we restore these seismic lines that we re-add in these microforms. Adding the hummocks will allow increased aeration, microbial activity, decomposition, nutrient availability, and we can see trees and other types of vegetation grow on these drier hummocks. But this decreases the water table and decreases the soil moisture. So it's important that we still have these hollows so that water loving vegetation like sphagnum can still thrive on the landscape. So for my study, we implemented new restoration treatments and we're gonna assess which of these treatments are most effective in establishing optimal conditions for the restoration of these seismic lines. So I'm first gonna talk about the soil moisture changes between the different restoration treatments. Then secondly, I'm gonna talk about how that soil moisture influenced the decomposition within the different treatments. And I'm gonna finish off by talking about the impacts of the different seismic line restoration treatments on the nutrient dynamics, specifically looking at the bioavailability and mineralization rates of nitrate, ammonium, and soluble reactive phosphorus. My study site is located on a tree peatland in the Alberta boreal forest, and it has two intersecting seismic lines. And we restored these seismic lines using ripping and mounding techniques. So we did three different kinds of ground reconfiguration approaches. We did a rip and lift, which is exactly how it sounds. It's ripping the peat to form a hummock and the ripped area acts as a hollow. Our first type of mounding was in line mounding where we took peat or excavated peat from the line and placed it next to the excavated area. The second kind of mounding was a hummock transfer, taking a hummock from off the line in the natural area and placing it on the line with that vegetation side up so that that vegetation can establish and spread and quickly restore the seismic line. We compared these three different treatments against a natural site that we use as a reference just off the seismic line and an untreated area of the line where no restoration occurred. When we look at our initial results from right after restoration, we can see that not surprisingly, our hollows are very saturated because these are low lying areas, but also we did receive 455 millimeters of precipitation between June and August, which is almost double the average precipitation during this time period. But you might notice that there is a difference in the soil moisture between the different hummocks, between the treatments. Particularly, you might notice that the natural and the hummock transfer have very similar soil moisture. I'll remind you that we took this hummock from the natural and placed it on the line for the hummock transfer. But it is interesting that we're seeing the same soil moisture. Perhaps that hummock that we relocated can still um, support trees and other vegetation that we see in the natural site. Another interesting thing is our other kind of mounding, in-line mounding, has very stable soil moisture and it has a low soil moisture. It's important to have a low soil moisture because if the hummocks are too saturated, this is gonna slow down the microbial activity, decreasing the decomposition. When we look at our decomposition results, we can see that we do have this elevated decomposition in our inline mounding hummocks, so we have that relationship between the soil moisture and the decomposition. This could be applying that perhaps we do have optimal soil moisture content in our hummocks of our inline mounding that's driving that increase in the microbial activity. With increased decomposition, we would expect to see increased nutrients. When we look at our nutrients, this is specifically looking at our soluble reactive phosphorus concentrations, we do see a slightly elevated um, bioavailability of phosphorus in our inline mounding hummocks. But when we look at our nitrogen, specifically here we're looking at our nitrate concentrations in July, we don't really see that same increase in the inline mounding hummocks. 
we see very similar results throughout our different restoration treatments on the line for the nitrate concentrations. But if you look, you'll notice that they're very low nitrate concentrations. So this can imply that as the nitrate's becoming available, it's being taken up by plants and microbes. Similarly, when we look at another form of nitrogen, ammonium concentrations, we can see that we also have slightly lower concentrations of ammonium in the restored treatments. And this also supports that theory that as the microbial communities are growing in these newly restored areas, they're taking up this available ammonium and using it for energy for themselves. When we look at our net mineralization of nitrogen, we see we also don't see this trend of increased um, mineralization rates in the inline mounding. So this once again supports that these microbes are immobilizing this nutrients once it becomes mineralized. So to conclude, we are seeing different changes in soil moisture between the different treatments, especially we're seeing a decrease in the mounding treatments. And that's translating to a higher decomposition rate, specifically in the mounding treatment of the inline mounding. But we're not seeing this relate back to the nutrient content for the nitrogen uh, mineralization. So that supports this theory that the microbes are using or immobilizing the mineralized nitrogen. So my future research or my next steps are going to be to investigate these links between what we're seeing in the soil nutrient pools to plant nutrient content to see is are these plants taking up this nutrients. I'm also going to look at adding fertilizer and seeing how the addition of fertilizer will change the nutrient dynamics on the seismic lines. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. I would love to take any questions now, or you can reach out to me by email or Twitter. Thank you. Thanks very much, Taylor. And certainly we have time for a few questions. I see there's one here in the chat. So the question is how, how often did you measure soil moisture and chemical properties? And is it surface soil moisture or averaged over a given depth beneath the surface? Okay, so we measured soil moisture. Um, we tried to do it throughout the summer and I think we did it about five or six times for each site. I would like to do it more if I get the chance to go out this summer. Um, we took the soil moisture at a particular depth, and uh, those readings are an average of those depths throughout the uh, growing season. Thank you. I'll, I'll ask a question as well. I was just curious about um, species in these in these plots and whether there might be a role of different species as you're transplanting from hummocks on the natural area to the seismic line. And if that's something that you'll consider in, in your research. Yeah, so on our seismic line, we really don't have many trees. So we actually did plant some trees this year so that we can go back and analyze the results from how it's gonna affect everything with having that kind of vegetation on the site. When we um, did the different restoration treatments, the hummocks that we brought from the natural site did have some trees or woody vegetation on them. But when we did the inline mounting, it really is just mostly sphagnum on those sites or other mosses that we just basically increased the elevation of that hummock. And we're hoping that the trees that we planted will establish there. Cool. And thank you. Um, I don't see any more questions. We have time for maybe one more quick question if anybody wants to put it in the Q&A box. All right, one more question from, from Nicholas. Thanks, Nicholas. Do you think that some modeling could be used to understand chemical dynamics? Um, I think so. I'm not quite sure. I'm not a modeler, so I'm not 100% sure, but it's possible. <laughs> uh, 
And maybe one more quick one here as we get ready to transition to our next speaker. Are invasive species at all an issue for the restoration? Um, we didn't see any invasive species on the line, but definitely um, the seismic lines do have a lot of, of sphagnum and other mosses. And, you know, that is going to help with increasing the hummock, like increasing the height of the vegetation and allowing those dry periods or dry spots to eventually like build. And that would help naturally bring back the trees. Um, but that takes a long time. And we're seeing like our site is about, we're not exactly sure how old, but about 50 years old. And when you look at it, you're just not seeing the trees and lichens that we want to see on our site there. So we're not seeing any invasive species, but we aren't seeing the species of plants that we want to be seeing coming back. Great, thank you. And with that answer, it is time to move on to our second speaker. So thanks again, Taylor. Really enjoyed the talk. And our second speaker for this afternoon is Miranda Hunter. Hi, Miranda. And she also joins us from the University of Waterloo. So the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Okay, so yeah. Hey everyone, my name is Miranda Hunter and I'm a grad student at the University of Waterloo. And the title of my talk today is Environmental Drivers Influence Carbon Emissions from Vacuum Extracted Peatlands. Before I start, I just want to thank all of my funding sources, my supervisors, my field partner, and everyone who helped me out in the field. So my project is on peat extraction, but what exactly is peat extraction? Well, companies start with a pristine peatland, like the one in image one. They remove the surface vegetation and the acrotelm, as seen in image two. They then install drainage ditches to lower the water table, as seen in image three, and then they begin to extract this peat. And in Canada, the primary method is vacuum extraction where they drive these harvesters over and vacuum suck up the top thin layer of the peat, they dry it and then sell it for horticulture purposes. And a peatland like this will get extracted anywhere from about 25 to 35 years before restoration can begin. So why do we wanna study carbon emissions during this active extraction period? Well, the peat extraction process will fundamentally alter the hydrology, vegetation and substrate quality of the peat which in turn affects the carbon emissions. And we know that extracted peatlands are a net source of carbon dioxide and methane, and that the fields are the biggest emitters of carbon dioxide, and the ditches are the biggest emitters of methane. We would expect to see a spatial distribution of environmental conditions at an extracted site. So here's an overhead view of one, and the total area that's extracted is called the sector, and you can see that there are drainage ditches going along the perimeter of it. There are also drainage ditches within the sector. And I've highlighted two of them here because they're kind of hard to see. And these all run parallel to each other. The area of peat between two drainage ditches is called the field. And these fields are generally about 30 meters wide. Due to the drainage ditches, we would expect hydraulic gradients to exist in a sector. And I'm gonna be focusing on the hydraulic gradients within a field because we'd expect to have greater drainage closer to the ditches and poor drainage towards the center of the field. Environmental drivers can help us understand the location and magnitude of these carbon emissions. So temperature is a well-studied driver and in general, there's a positive relationship between them, both in research on pristine peatlands and in extracted ones. And so temperature will be important to study in this ecosystem because following extraction, we might expect to see increases in soil temperature or increased diurnal fluctuations due to the removal of the vegetation and changes in the heat capacity of the peat. Hydrology is another important driver. And for this research, I was focusing on soil moisture. And in general, there's a unimodal relationship between these two though this relationship hasn't been heavily studied in extracted peatlands. 
And soil moisture will be important to study because in an extracted peatland, we'll see a decrease in water table, obviously, but there still may be a pretty high capillary fringe due to the compaction of the pores and the increase in bulk density. My work is part of a larger group of researchers conducting research on extracted peatlands across Canada, and I'm focusing my field work out in Ceiba Beach, Alberta. And the objectives I'm going to be presenting on today are to assess the spatial distribution of carbon dioxide and methane emissions and to assess the environmental drivers of carbon dioxide and methane emissions from actively extracted peatlands. Before I get to my sites, I want to acknowledge that my project takes place within Treaty 6 territory and Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 4. So this past summer, I conducted field work out in Alberta, and these are Google Earth images of my three sectors, an old, an intermediate, and a young sector. The age here refers to when extraction began. And we set up 21 transects across these three sectors and their locations are shown in the yellow circles. These transects were located perpendicular to the drainage ditches. And we took measurements two meters, five meters and 15 meters from the drainage ditch to try and capture that hydraulic gradient. And the transects were located on multiple fields to further increase our spatial variability. To measure these carbon emissions, we used the closed chamber dynamic method. So we measured carbon dioxide, methane, and then our environmental variables, so temperature and soil moisture. I was just measuring carbon emissions from the fields, not from the ditches. Um, so just what I'm gonna be presenting on today. And for soil moisture, due to equipment limitations, we only measured this a few times at each site and over a pretty short time period. So this is very preliminary results for that. I also want to mention that it was a very wet year. The 15 year average of growing season precipitation in the area is about 330 millimeters. And last year there was about 460 millimeters of rain, which is getting close to the yearly precipitation budget. So on to some of my results. Here I have plotted carbon dioxide emissions versus the sectors, the old, intermediate, and young. The colors of the box plots represent the flux position along the transect, so two meters, five meters, and 15 meters from the drainage ditch. You can see that there was a significant decrease in CO2 emissions with age of the sector. So the youngest sector had the highest emissions, the oldest had the lowest. You can also see that there was no difference in carbon dioxide emissions between the flux positions, though maybe a slight trend of increasing emissions with increasing distance from the ditch. And now here's the same plot, but with my methane data. And again, so you can see that for methane, there was no difference in emissions between the different sectors. Though like CO2, there was also no difference in methane emissions between the flux positions. Though here may be a trend of greater range of methane values closer to the ditch and that decreasing as we get further away from the ditch. So I looked at my environmental drivers to see if they could help explain these carbon emissions. So I'll start with carbon dioxide. Here's a plot of carbon dioxide versus soil temperature at the different sectors. And you can see that there was a positive relationship between them, which was expected. And when I added, included this in a linear mixed effects model, it explained 35% of the variation in carbon dioxide emissions. I then added soil moisture. So here's a plot of carbon dioxide versus soil moisture. And interestingly, you can see that at the young site, there's a positive relationship there, but not at the intermediate or old. The positive relationship could suggest a moisture stress for the microbes and that we're on the first part of that unimodal relationship. There's a pretty narrow range of soil moisture values at the old and intermediate site, just given my limited sampling. So I'm curious next summer when I can measure this for the whole summer, if I do find a positive relationship there. But when I added soil moisture to the linear model, it explained, along with soil temperature, 73% of the variance in carbon dioxide emissions. 
So even this, even though this is a smaller data set, it does suggest that soil moisture is a really important driver of carbon dioxide emissions. Moving on to my methane data, here's a plot of methane versus soil temperature. There is a positive relationship between them. And when I added this to the linear mixed effects model, it explained 8% of the variation in methane. With my soil moisture data, you can see again, there's a positive relationship between them at the young site, but not at the intermediate or old site. A positive relationship would make sense given that methane is produced under anaerobic conditions. And when I added this to the model, it explained 17% of the variance. This is a much lower explanatory power than for carbon dioxide, but methane is notoriously difficult to measure and understand. So some of my key conclusions. First, I found that there was a significant decrease in carbon dioxide emissions with age of the sector. This does make sense since as you keep extracting, you're exposing the older, more recalcitrant peat. Why didn't I see this relationship with methane? One reason could be that these fields just emit really low levels of methane to begin with. Another reason could be that since it was a really wet year, um, there was lots of areas of the peat that were ana anaerobic. And so that might've offset differences in the labile carbon. Another conclusion was that there was limited spatial distribution of emissions from the fields. So, you know, no differences, two meters, five meters, and 15 meters from the ditch. I'm not exactly sure why that happened. Um, it's not the trend that I was expecting, but I'm excited to go and take these measurements all again next summer and do them for the whole summer. And I'm gonna add water table as well. And so we'll see if I can better understand what was happening there. And then finally, um, I found that soil temperature and soil moisture were important drivers of these emissions and should continue to be studied in extracted peatlands. So thanks for listening to my talk and I'm willing to answer any questions you have. Thanks very much, Miranda. And yeah, just a reminder, in case those of you who are joining, some of you are joining late, at the bottom of your screen, you'll notice there's a Q&A button there. So we ask that if you have any questions, you just pop that open, type in your question, and then I will uh, relay the, those to our to our speakers. So I see there's one there. Uh, so this question asks if your results are coincident with other sites in the area, and if there's a geographic difference or similarity between your site and other locations in the region. Yeah, so good question. Um, to my knowledge, there hasn't been much else done on extracted peatlands like this in Alberta. Um, there's some researchers who I'm working with who are looking at this out in Quebec. Um, there are gonna be regional differences just because out in Alberta, the fields are totally flat. Whereas out in Quebec, they dome their fields to help with drainage. So along those transects, you're not just gonna get a difference in hydrology, but also an age difference. because you're gonna have older peat closer to the ditch. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something that we're looking at. Thanks, Miranda. And, and I'll, I'll ask you a question. You may have uh, you may have described this in your talk, so apologies if if um, if uh, you already covered it. I was uh, just remind me of the you had a young, uh, intermediate, and old. What those ages are, and are these sites um, after the peat is extracted? Are they abandoned, or are they required to re restore them? And uh, kind of what what ty what time scales does that happen? Yeah, so um, my sites along the bottom here, I had the old one started extraction 1991 and then 2010 and 2017. These are all still under active extraction. Um, I don't know too much about the restoration. I know, I think they are required to start restoration and there's a big you know, group of people looking at the best way to restore them and trade-offs between you know, how soon you should start restoring them to get that carbon back. Great, thanks. 
And I see there's another another question here. So that's great. Keep them coming for those of you that are listening in online. Was it surprising that fluxes of carbon dioxide were high at sites with very high soil moisture? Yeah. And, and, and sorry, and there's a second part. Were there other factors influencing those very wet sites? Yeah, so I definitely was surprised to see that positive relationship. Um, those soil moisture data, it is very preliminary because I only measured soil moisture a few times. So I'll definitely have to see next summer if I find that again. But yeah, I was surprised, but um, these sites are drained. And so there might have yeah, just been a moisture stress for the microbes. And we have time for another couple of questions, if there are any out there. All right, so another question. How do these carbon dioxide fluxes compare to natural peatlands? Yeah, good question. So in terms of the net ecosystem exchange, these extracted peatlands will have higher emissions because there's no uptake of carbon through the vegetation. But in terms of if you compare like the soil respiration between an extracted peatland and a natural one, uh, different studies have seen different things uh, just because you have to take into account as you keep extracting, you're getting to that older, more recalcitrant peat. So I think several of the studies I've looked at have seen that they're sometimes lower in an extracted peatland compared to a natural one, that soil respiration. Thanks for that, Miranda. And time for, oh yeah, another question. They're coming in. Um, you said you didn't measure soil moisture very much this year, uh, but did it decrease to the middle of the field like you predicted? Yeah, so uh, not really. Um, it definitely was higher, uh, close. Yeah, it would increase as you got um, closer to the center of the field. Um, but that difference wasn't significant. Um, and it was in the range of, you know, 10% difference in soil moisture. So not as big of a difference as I would have expected, but it, there was a lot of rain this summer. Um, and so the drainage ditches just might have not been as effective as they would have been under drier conditions. And one more question before we move on. Did you see carbon uptake on apparently bare soil that might suggest photosynthetic microbes? Interesting question. Uh, no, I don't think I did. Um, yeah, I think it was all net release of uh, CO2. But yeah, I'll definitely have to look back on that. All right, I think we will leave it there for questions. Appreciate the talk, Miranda. Thank you very much. Thanks for organizing this.
And thanks also to those of you that are uh, helping in, uh, with the questions. It's great for especially our students to get them thinking about some different things. So appreciate that. Uh, <clears throat> so we will move on to our third speaker. And Mohammed, Mohammed is Hannah Manzar is our third speaker for this afternoon. Also thinking about uh, wetlands and restoration. And he joins us from the University of Sherbrooke. Hi there, Mohammed. Hey, thank you very much. The floor is yours. I'm just going to share my screen. You bet. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for um, organizing this event. Uh, my name is Mohammad Bijani Manzar, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at University of Sherbrooke in Quebec. Um, what I'm going to present you today is um, the hydrological effect of wetlands. So basically, the idea is um, finding the optimum location of wetlands for restoration in order to, uh, to in order to better control the flood with uh, with, with wetlands. Um, uh, Mohammed, could you could sorry, could you just maximize your slide so that we have it a little bit bigger on our screens? Sure. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, before starting the presentation, I would like to thank uh, the collaborators, the uh, Kobarik uh, uh, Watershed Conservation Authorities, uh, Orangus Climate Ecology, and University of Sherman for supporting this research. Uh, so I start off my presentation with the effects of uh, just a brief introduction on, on wetlands and hydroecologic system and why they are important. And then I move on to um, the SWAT hydrologic model, which uh, is the, uh, one of the mostly used uh, models for modeling of wetlands in hydrologic system. And the original representation versus the improved one that we used in research. Um, uh, then we go to hypothetical wetland scenarios, uh, finding the location of uh, wetlands uh, that are uh, uh, critical in our watershed, uh, some results and conclusion. Uh, so wetlands offer a variety of services for us. So uh, natural regression of river flow uh, during the, the floods, they store water and they uh, support the base flow during the summer, which is exactly what, uh, what we want in, in, in a healthy watershed system. They support the groundwater recharge, uh, protect the bank erosion, and they, they work as a, a stormwater management uh, uh, retention pump. Uh, they also have water quality benefits, such as uh, controlling the sediments and contaminants. Uh, and for climate change aspect, uh, they have the, the carbon sequestration effect, which can store a huge amount of carbon uh, uh, that uh, is very effective for uh, planning and adapta adaptation of uh, watersheds for future. Now, uh, from the hydrological standpoint, uh, we have uh, isolated versus riparian wetlands. So this classification is for uh, modeling wetlands in hydrology. So isolated wetlands are those that are uh, isolated, as the name says, from the hydrological um, or water networks such as rivers and lakes and riparian wetlands are those that are adjacent to the rivers and they are in constant um, interaction with river network and they are periodically flooded. Um, what you see is in purple are isolated wetlands and the greens are riparian wetlands. So isolated wetlands in SWAT uh, they are represented at HRU scale. So HRU, uh, if you want to see in a, a very uh, uh, simplified uh, form, they are unique combination of soil, uh, soil type, land use, and topography. So if we have this subbasin, so we this we uh, uh, classify the subbasins into multiple HRUs for calculation in SWOT, and 
uh, all the HRUs connect directly to the river. So basically there is no interaction from the runoff and other hydrological processes between the HRUs. And so we don't know if the hydro, uh, HRUs located upstream of a, an isolated wetland can, if we change them, for example, if there's a change in land use, how they can affect the, uh, the dynamics of isolated wetland and the flow eventually, since there is no interaction with them. Uh, the other thing is that isolated wetlands, the, the amount of water they, they receive is limited to the HRU boundaries. So if, for example, what you see in the red dash, if the isolated wetland has a, a drainage area that is that goes beyond the HRU boundaries, so this part is uh, removed from uh, the SWAT calculation. Uh, other limitation is, uh, about the calculation of isolated wetlands in SWAT is they receive only surface runoff uh, uh, as, as, as the inflow, and the spillage will be the amount of water that exceeds its maximum capacity. Uh, whereas in the revised structure that I'm just going to explain in a few slides later, uh, we have the contribution from surface runoff, from the lateral uh, flow in the soil, and the groundwater flow. Which represents, uh, which better represents the dynamics uh, and realistic behavior of the, the isolated wetlands. Uh, now, in order to to model the, the the isolated wetlands with revised structure, so we have to classify, we have to uh, reconstruct, uh, in fact, the HRU boundaries. Now, those areas that are beyond the the drainage area of HRU are are a unique HRUs for us now, and uh, we know which HRU exactly to draining to which isolated wetlands. Now, uh, it's, it's, we, are able to un, we, we are able to see if there is a change in land use in, in one of these HRUs that are draining to the to isolated wetlands, or, or what's gonna be the effect on this. Um, there's also a, a, an interaction between isolated wetlands. So basically, the one is that is in downstream will receive water from the upstream, uh, which is uh, the case in reality. So uh, it's, it's, it's a lot uh, more uh, uh, distributed compared to the original version of the slot. Now, uh, in case of riparian wetlands, when there is a riparian wetland, so we have to aggregate all of them uh, in the scale of uh, uh, basin, uh, and so. Uh, there is the concept of hydrologic, hydro, hydrologic equivalent wetland, which replaces wetlands, uh, multiple uh, riparian wetlands at the scale of subbasin with one, uh, and so that one is uh, is coupled basically to the isolated wetlands as well. Now there are some steps, uh, some additional steps for the model, for modeling of SWOT uh, with, with the revised version. So uh, this uh, so watershed delineation and then the HRUs are uh, same as the SWOT default. Now here we have the classification of wetlands, whether it's isolated or riparian. And so we have to reconstruct, as I said, the HRU map and uh, some equivalent uh, riparian wetlands uh, in, in scale of what uh, the watershed and the last step is the parameterization of all this wetland. Uh, so my case study uh, is uh, the Famine River, which is one of the subwatersheds of Chaudière uh, watershed in, in Quebec. Uh, it's about 700 kilometers square and wetlands cover near 80.4% 80, 80 of the, uh, the surface area. Uh, the watershed is basically forest, uh, and so there are some agricultural activities in it as well. Uh, we calibrated and validated model uh, based on the observations we had at the outlet of the catchment, and so what we see here from 2000 to 2010, uh, we used the calibration, and uh, the model can uh, adequately uh, uh, represent the, the dynamic of the uh, river flow at the outlet of the catchment. Um, now, for the results, uh, I'm going to present you two, two results. Uh, the first one is the, the extreme scenarios. Uh, what happens if we remove the wetlands uh, to the uh, floods with different return periods? Basically, we look at 10 year, 20 year, 50 year, and 100 year return period of uh, uh, flow. Uh, uh, when wetlands are gone, and second, uh, we see the, the optimal location of wetlands. So 
Our first result is uh, here we have the results when all the wetlands are gone in yellow. What you see is uh, in uh, uh, three flow, uh, the two year interferiot, uh, we have 50% increase in the flow compared to the actual situation where all the wetlands are uh, in the system. Uh, so we have a trend of increase in uh, uh, in the uh, floods with different return periods when the plants are gone, which uh, is, is very important. So what we see, if we remove all the riparian plants, we have an increase in 25% to 31% uh, increase in the peak flow. And for isolated wetlands, uh, we have near 5 to 9%. So basically, removal of uh, riparian wetlands uh, can lead to uh, a higher uh, peak flow in the watershed. As, uh, as opposed to or, uh, isolated wetlands. And removal of all the wetlands can significantly change the hydrology from 50% to 9, near uh, 65% of changes in peak flow. Now, for wetland scenarios, uh, we have here eight scenarios plus the baseline, which is the actual situation. Now, uh, there are two scenarios. Our first one is uh, riparian wetland removal. All the riparian wetlands are gone. Uh, basically are replaced by agricultural areas and uh, we uh, and only the isolated uh, wetlands exist uh, as you see with the, with the red spots. Now for isolated wetland removal is the opposite. All the isolated wetlands are gone and riparian wetlands exist. We have two scenarios for the isolated wetlands and uh, those that are in the upstream areas basically far from the river they are kept and the, 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 those isolated wetlands that are close to the river network, still isolated, but they are uh, removed in this scenario. Uh, um, for down uh, isolated wetlands on, uh, on lowlands, basically we keep the lowland removed uplands. For riparian wetlands, we keep the, uh, in RWS1, we keep the riparian wetlands on the first orders. We remove all other riparian wetlands and uh, for the second order, third order. So here is the result for the maximum annual flow. Uh, we see we remove, when we remove the riparian wetlands, uh, we have increase in maximum flow. Uh, same thing for isolated wetlands, but riparian wetlands are, uh, the increase for riparian wetlands are uh, more than zero. And for isolated wetland location, uh, when we remove riparian isolated wetlands on the downstream, we have higher increase in the, uh, in the uh, Qmax as opposed to um, isolated wetland on upstream. And for riparian wetland location, uh, when we keep the isolated wetlands uh, plus the riparian wetlands on the first order, uh, we are uh, in a good state compared to removing the riparian wetlands uh, at the first order, basically. Uh, this result is close to the baseline. Now, the question we had was, uh, if we, want, uh, if we want to normalize the results, basically we want to restore the wetlands and where we should start with. So is there a, a kind of index that can help us uh, the location of finding the best location for the wetlands? So we define this in this, uh, it's called the wetland impact index. Um, so in order to normalize the, the, the flow, uh, the maximum flows, the smaller this value is, the greater the, the impact will be. Uh, I, if you have any questions, so just ask after that. Uh, I, I don't want to enter to all the, the, the rational and uh, details of the, defining the, the, the index. So here we have the results uh, for the wetland impact index. Uh, if we keep the riparian wetlands, you see the index is smaller. Basically, it's better choice compared to keeping only isolated. Wetlands. Now, uh, isolated wetlands on upstream, uh, if we keep them, uh, they are uh, working uh, more efficient compared to the downstreams and riparian wetlands on the uh, uh, first order streams, they are much more effective than, than the, those that are connected to the main channel. So for conclusion, uh, wetlands can significantly reduce the flood peaks, uh, their degradation can change the hydrological behavior of the watershed. Uh, in the watershed, riparian wetlands uh, seem to be uh, more effective for controlling the flood. Uh, 
the improved representation of the wetlands in SWAT can help us better see the uh, more digital morphic, morphological location of wetlands effect on, on hydrological behavior of the watershed. Uh, our plant isolated wetlands more effective than lowland. Uh, this can be uh, because of the surrounding landscapes, such as topography, uh, the soil characteristics, and the type of the land use that is uh, around the isolated wetland. And last uh, is the wetland impact index uh, can help the decision make makers, uh, basically the watershed uh, conservation authorities to identify, uh, to better uh, know their wetlands and identify uh, the best location of wetlands for restoration. Thank you very much. And I'm ready to answer your question. Thanks very much, Mohammed. And I see we have one question in our Q&A box, so we can start with that. First question for you, how did you demarcate the HRUs? Is this done in an automated way using vegetation maps or remote sensing? And is there a value yeah. of so selecting the HRUs without using some automated algorithm? Yeah, basically the, uh, the denomination of HRU is uh, as, as one of the steps that is uh, in the R plot or, or uh, Q plot, basically. Uh, so basically you have uh, to delineate the sub watersheds before. You give the, tip, uh, the M, the topography and autological network. And after that, the sub watersheds uh, are delineated. And then you give the land use. Uh, we use the land use map of uh, what we have here uh, in uh, climate change uh, department uh, or uh, the government uh, portal for, for downloading this, this data uh, for land use, the soil, same thing for soil. Uh, the slope is, you can define it uh, in, in, uh, 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 based on the topography and then you have the HR use. Great, and we have a, another question. Uh, did you consider underground water connectivity for the isolated wetlands? Very good question. Yeah, the groundwater uh, is connected in the revised version of the, the uh, SWAT. So uh, if I'm just gonna um, move uh, to this slide, uh, basically, you'll see that uh, isolated wetland, uh, they receive uh, water in the revised structure uh, from the, the groundwater flow from the, uh, the HRUs that are draining uh, to this isolated wetland. Uh, so the uh, groundwater is uh, also uh, uh, included uh, in, in the revised structure as opposed to the default approach. Okay. Great. And another question here about the main threats to the riparian wetlands in, in this watershed or similar watersheds. What are the main threats and does the wetland size impact that threat? Uh, yeah, definitely wetland size impact uh, the threats. Uh, basically, uh, what we have in, in Famine, uh, uh, the isolated wetlands are more in threat, basically and uh, riparian wetlands as well, but basically more uh, uh, isolated wetlands are uh, close to the agricultural fields. So uh, intensive agricultural activities now uh, is draining uh, these isolated wetlands, but same thing can be uh, for uh, the riparian wetlands as well. Okay, and uh, another question here about the groundwater. So the role, what role does groundwater play in the modeling process, particularly for the riparian wetlands in your system. Yeah, that's the, the same thing for isolated wetlands. We have the connection for riparian wetlands. So now the, the riparian wetlands, if they if they exist in the subwatershed, they receive water uh, from the upstream areas of the HR used in the subbasin. And so if the riparian wetland basically receive water from groundwater, uh, from surface runoff uh, after passing through the isolated wetlands. And they, uh, they also receive the precipitation and they also seep uh, water through the soil uh, uh, to, to their bed, bed in fact. 
Uh, so the groundwater rules is is very important. It is considered, uh, in fact, in the in the model modeling process. All right, great. Thanks, thanks, Mohammed. Thanks for your responses, Thank you very and, much. and thanks to all those who answered, uh, asked, asked some questions of our speaker. We're right on schedule here, so I think we're ready to move on to our fourth talk. Our next speaker is Lorna Harris from the University of Alberta. Welcome, Lorna. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, just share my screen. Okay, um, good afternoon everyone. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about uh, northern peatlands in Canada um, and specifically their role in providing a carbon service. Um, so I'll give a brief overview of the science that supports this, um, highlight some gaps in both the science and the policy, and then I'll be outlining some policy recommendations um, so we can work to protect this carbon service. Um, so this is a project I've been working on for the past year with WCS Canada and many co-authors. Um, not everyone is listed here um, just because not everyone has had a chance to, to see the most recent version of the paper. So why do peatlands matter? Um, we know, <coughs> excuse me, global temperatures are rising and that we have to manage the land carbon sink. This will be very important in determining if we can limit this increase in temperature. We know peatlands uh, will play a very critical role here as high carbon ecosystems. Um, with the conservation and restoration of peatlands highlighted as a response option um, of the, um, in the IPCC climate change and land report. We also know uh, that we have to act now um, if we are going to prevent significant uh, long-term climate impacts. So we have around one quarter of the world's peatlands in Canada, um, with these peatlands representing the world's largest peatland carbon stock. Um, these peatlands vary across Canada. Some are very open um, landscapes like the photograph on the top right, an example from the Hudson Bay lowland, or some of them can be have quite dense tree cover, like the example on the lower right, uh, which is from Western Canada. So it's important to, to highlight here that huge areas of these peatlands um, are Indigenous lands, um, and that Indigenous-led conservation of these peatlands is very important. So I'm just going to highlight uh, an example here of Canada's first Indigenous protected and conserved area, um, the Adeje protected area. This is uh, twice the size of Banff National Park with a very large portion as wetlands with um, a lot of carbon in there as well as so many other valuable ecosystem services. So we know the carbon stored in Canada's peatlands provides a very important climate cooling service. Um, it essentially represents the avoided emission that would occur if these ecosystems were to be altered by human disturbance. And recent studies suggest that these peatlands will continue as a persistent carbon sink in most future climate change scenarios. However, if these peatlands are disturbed and we lose the carbon, um, we have the problem of trying to regain that carbon within the next 30 years or so, um, so that that carbon loss does not cause major climate impacts. So a recent paper by Goldstein in Nature Climate Change um, termed this carbon loss as irrecoverable carbon. And they outlined likely scenarios for the world's ecosystems and the impacts of disturbance, um, mostly in this paper it was land conversion, um, on the irrecoverable carbon. So in this diagram, uh, which I copied from the paper, um, you can see boreal peatlands uh, at the, the bottom of the diagram. Um, they're a large carbon store, um, but noted to have very little historical loss or recent loss compared to other ecosystems, such as tropical forests, 
um, or tropical peatlands, which you'll see out to the, the right hand side of the diagram. Um, so I think we may need more discussion on this, uh, but certainly relative to tropical peatlands, um, northern peatlands are not under a significant immediate threat. Um, and this is important because it gives us time to plan for long-term carbon management. So in Canada, we have an opportunity to do this, um, to do it right, as although this map showing infrastructure in, uh, in peatlands in Canada looks uh, really bad, um, there are still large areas of mostly intact peatlands in Canada. Um, and one of these areas, the intact peatlands areas, is the Hudson Bay Lowland, the world's second largest continuous expanse of peatland. Um, this is a hydrologically connected landscape, um, a just amazing landscape of continuous bogs and bends, just all, all peatland. Um, and here it's very important because infrastructure impacts are currently uh, very small. You can see the boundary of the Hudson Bay Lowland there and the black lines don't really encroach into the, the main area of that region. But we still have uh, some work to do um, to not only increase our understanding of the carbon stored and greenhouse gas emissions um, and removals from undisturbed peatlands, uh, but also to improve our assessments of carbon loss from different disturbances and particularly looking at the impacts on irrecoverable carbon. So I know Maria Strack and Scott Davidson have been working on disturbance impacts and trying to quantify the carbon dynamics from these disturbance impacts across Canada. Um, so I'm not going to go into to that detail here. Here I'm just presenting a conceptual understanding of disturbance impacts, um, specifically in relation to irrecoverable carbon as outlined by Goldstein. So in this diagram on the right, I've applied the concept of irrecoverable carbon um, by Goldstein to a northern peatland. And in this example, it is a peat extraction site, which we've just heard about uh, earlier in the seminar. Um, so during uh, extraction, there is a significant peat carbon loss, um, as well as above ground uh, biomass. Um, we heard earlier the, the entire upper surface is removed, the aquatelm as we call it, and then it is drained so that they can slowly start removing the rest of the, the deeper peat underneath that. So we know here that we can restore these peatlands um, and that we can get sphagnum recovery, um, but it's important to note that this portion of carbon recovery is still very small compared to the irrecoverable peat carbon. And that's because during that time frame of 30 years, um, we just don't, we can't gain back that carbon that is lost because peat accumulation um, is, is a very slow process. Um, but we do know um, that we can get these peatlands working on the right track again, um, with Kelly Nugent's work showing that these sites can return to a carbon sink um, within a decade if there is careful restoration. Um, so we also know um, for these sites how much area is impacted um, and we know the total greenhouse gas emissions as they are included in Canada's uh, national reporting and um, their greenhouse gas inventory. So we have conceptual diagrams for other disturbance impacts such as permafrost thaw, fire, drainage, I've just included that, that one example for today. Um, but one of the problems I came across in completing this assessment was the issue of having limited data um, available for the disturbance impacts for different peatlands across Canada. Um, one of the reasons for this is the fact that a large portion of Canada's peatlands are termed um, unmanaged land. Um, in that there are no direct human disturbances or disturbances within our control in these northern peatland areas. So for this large area of Canada's peatlands, um, which is above this line here on the, the map, the northern part of those peatlands, um, greenhouse gas emissions and removals um, are not reported in the, the national inventory. Um, 
So there is no mechanism um, because of this or policy incentive to, to coordinate research for those areas and to uh, bring that research together um, in a reporting effort. Um, so that hampers our other um, efforts to, to understand carbon losses and disturbances in these areas. We also know that greenhouse gas reporting for peatland disturbances in managed land is poor. Um, so this also contributes to the data problem. Um, and that few of peatlands in Canada are legally protected. Um, impacts on peatland carbon are also currently not included in impact assessments for development. Um, we know peat cover and depth varies across the landscape. Um, do we know how much peat will need to be excavated? Can this be avoided? This information is currently not included in most impact assessments. Um, are detailed peat surveys required for developments in Canada? And I've included here an example of peat survey guidance for developments in Scotland. Um, this started out as a, a very simple Word document that was shared with stakeholders and has now developed over the last decade to a complicated uh, flowchart and uh, a full guidance document available online. Um, so Scotland also has a carbon calculator for wind farms um, on peatlands. Um, this started out uh, back in 2008 as a, an Excel spreadsheet, um, but now I haven't checked on it after a very long time now. It's, it's developed into a, a uh, an online tool, um, a much improved online tool that also records all the information that was added into it. And this tool assesses those carbon impacts for wind farm developments in Scotland. And it is a requirement for all environmental impact assessments for wind farm developments in Scotland. So the question then is, do we already have the tools to assess the impact of development on the land carbon sink? Can we adapt this tool, for example, for developments in Canada, not just wind farms, but other developments? So in Canada, we have an opportunity um, to recognize the importance of carbon stored in Canada's peatlands and to plan for the long-term carbon management of these ecosystems. So what can we do? Uh, first of all, we can identify um, the significant peatland carbon stores, and that includes um, so much better mapping for peatlands across Canada. Um, we also need to identify policy mechanisms to safeguard um, those significant peatland carbon stores. And this may include um, designing, supporting financial mechanisms to reduce peatland carbon emissions. Um, in land use planning, this may also involve, um, involve prioritizing avoidance over mitigation in land use planning and planning for long-term carbon management. We can also support and fund Indigenous-led conservation and stewardship of these carbon stores. Um, highlighting in this uh, map to the right here, the um, Mishkegawak First Nations for the Hudson Bay Lowland and the overlap of their land with the peatlands um, in that region. Um, so they obviously play a very important role in, in conserving that landscape. We can also invest in Indigenous guardians to help monitor and protect northern peatlands. And this is a program that has, has been implemented in other areas across Canada. Can we expand it to other areas? Um, and then specifically for peatlands. Um, can we improve greenhouse gas reporting for peatlands in Canada's national inventory? This would go a long way to helping with uh, data collection, collating data uh, for specific goals for understanding carbon loss across Canada. So not just Western Canada, Hudson Bay Lowland included, and also across the Eastern Canada, recognizing there are huge regional differences in um, the peatlands across Canada. And then lastly, um, we need to pull all of this, all of these policy mechanisms together in a pan-Canadian peatland strategy. Um, so that would be developed with multiple stakeholders across Canada um, so that we can improve our scientific understanding of the peatlands in Canada and then also better protect and conserve those peatlands 
Um, other countries have developed peatland strategies. Scotland is one of them. Um, I was involved in that at the early stages. It's, it's expanded considerably. It's probably a lot easier to do in Scotland, be much smaller. But as Canada has a large portion of the world's peatlands, it's certainly something that Canada should be stepping forward um, to develop, to uh, take on this role. Um, so with that, I thank you and we'll take questions. Thanks very much, Lorna. And I see that there is one question waiting for us. So the question to you is, where are the areas of most concern in Canada where peatlands are changing at an unprecedented rate? And what can we most effectively learn from other countries such as Scotland? Um, so in terms of areas where there has been um, a lot of change, um, there's, there's numerous different regions. There's obviously permafrost peatlands. We're seeing huge changes in permafrost peatlands across Canada. Um, there are issues with fire, um, although the response um, there will be different for Western Canada as it is for Eastern Canada. So we need to understand that. Um, there are obviously huge changes when I showed you that map um, of infrastructure. I go back. Yeah, infrastructure across Canada, it looks really bad for Alberta and the Northwest Territories. And that's partly because of all of these seismic lines that we have uh, cutting across all of these peatlands, um, which is obviously not the case for the Hudson Bay Lowland area. Great, and, and there was one more component of that question. And I know you touched on this a little bit, um, so the need for better computational systems, databases, and tracking to merge aspects of policy and science. In terms of is that a, a good idea, yeah. or how do we do that? Yeah, is there is is there is there are there limit? I guess the question perhaps is are there are there limitations to existing systems? And uh, yeah, do you have recommendations yeah. on what might make might facilitate merging these aspects of policy and science and the data that would support those? I think, yeah, I think currently because the, a large portion of these peelons are not covered in the greenhouse gas inventory, that does, it would help if that was included because then that would provide a mechanism to actually put these systems into place, into one place to pull everything together to increase um, collaboration across different stakeholders, because I know different people are working on different aspects of this across the country, um, universities, government. So I think that also comes into play for a, a peatland strategy and actually bringing all of those stakeholders together. So we can identify what mechanisms we have already, um, what works and what we can perhaps improve on, and then what we need to, to build. Um, to get this working. Okay, great. And I see another question here from Carl. Is there a mechanism by which unmanaged land somehow becomes managed land and, they and therefore presumably easier to inventory or follow carbon inventories? Um, yeah, so there are only a few countries that actually split uh, the land into the unmanaged versus managed. As far as I know, Canada does this because there's a large portion of those greenhouse gas emissions in those areas that it's not really within a, a direct control. Obviously a lot of greenhouse gas emissions from fire, from permafrost though. Um, but if those areas are subject to disturbance, a direct human disturbance, then ideally that is in included as managed land and those that carbon should be assessed, but we know that it's it's not really covered very well. Um, mm -hmm. I know from looking at various environmental impact assessments that um, the carbon is not quantified for developments within 
the unmanaged land and it's really quite poor for developments within the managed land. So we've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> Great. Thank you. And time for one more question, if there is one out there. All right. Thanks very much, Lorna. Okay, thank you. And we are ready to move on to the fifth presentation. Maria Strack is here and she joins us from the University of Waterloo or somewhere near there anyways today for her talk. So take it away, Maria. Thanks very much. And um, Lorna has given me a good introduction there. Uh, so I will continue on talking about peatland management in Canada. And this is some work that Scott Davidson and I have been working on. Um, and so I want to share with you today what we found sort of compiling what some opportunities are to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through peatland management but also highlight some of the knowledge gaps and maybe some of the interesting trade-offs that we might need to face. And some of those were, will echo the things that, that Lorna has just mentioned. So before I start, I just wanna acknowledge the partners that have made this possible and in particular, Nature United, who is taking the lead right now on trying to compile the potential for natural climate solutions across Canada in, from managing all types of ecosystems. And as Lorna also alluded to in her presentation, I also want to acknowledge that when we think about land management in Canada, of course, Canada is the traditional territory of Indigenous groups who were here managing that landscape for thousands of years before settlers arrived. And we've worked to compile data across the country, which would represent the traditional territories of many different groups. But we choose to acknowledge today the territory on which we live and work here in Waterloo Region, which is the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. And we encourage others to take the time to think of and acknowledge the traditional territories on which they also work. So as Lorna introduced, uh, this work is really coming out of a place where we know that we are facing a climate crisis the actions that are going to be really important for us to take over the next few decades are to rapidly transition away from our fossil fuel use. But in that transition period towards greener energy, we are going to need to use all of the tools in our toolbox in order to, um, to, to get there. And so particularly over the next few decades, it'll be very important to think about other types of activities we can do to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And some of those that people have been talking about a lot recently are what we call natural climate solutions. Um, and so a paper a couple of years ago by Griscombe and colleagues calculated for the globe what the potential of these natural climate solutions might be. And they came up with a pretty big number of maybe up to 24 petagrams of CO2 equivalent and maybe more tangibly that they could provide more than a third of the cost effective climate mitigation needed through 2030, so basically in the near term. So when we talk about natural climate solutions, these are ways of managing the land that would help to address climate change by directly reducing land use and land use change greenhouse gas emissions, but maybe by managing the land so that we could encourage it to capture and store additional carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, or that might improve ecosystem resilience to that ongoing climate change. And so what Scott and I have focused on in this project are really these first two, looking at how we could reduce emissions or um, sort of maintain the carbon uptake that we have in our ecosystems. And there's many different ways to, um, to incorporate these natural climate solutions. We could consider forestry, changing agriculture pr practices, coastal wetlands, but what we're gonna focus on today are peatlands. And as Lorna introduced, one of the reasons that this is really important in Canada is that we just have a lot of peatlands. They cover over 12% of the land area, but maybe more importantly, they represent a large carbon sink with current estimates of about 
150 to 160 billion tons of carbon stored in peatland soils in Canada. And so this is a substantial amount of carbon that we should protect uh, and manage to the best of our ability when we're facing a climate crisis. So just to sort of explain what some of the options would be for these natural climate solutions, we can start by thinking about our natural peatlands, which we know are net carbon and greenhouse gas sinks. So even though they emit, emit a small amount of methane, this small persistent uptake of carbon dioxide over thousands of years has resulted in a carbon and greenhouse gas sink. If some sort of disturbance happens on the landscape, we can convert those sites into greenhouse gas sources. And so one way that we could create a natural climate solution is just to avoid that disturbance and then avoid those emissions. We could also then apply some restoration to those degraded ecosystems and try to turn them back into a carbon sink or at least a smaller carbon source with the hope that they'll eventually return to their natural ecosystem functioning. So we could either improve the mechanisms that we use to get better restoration, or we could just restore larger areas. So there are many different threats to peatlands currently, some of which are really, they're just facing because of this ongoing climate change. So things like permafrost thaw, increasing wildfire severity and extent. And while there may be some ways that we can manage certain aspects of these, what Scott and I chose to focus on were the direct anthropogenic actions on the landscape where we were really applying a direct anthropogenic footprint to those peatlands. And so those include things like linear disturbances, so like the seismic lines that Taylor introduced earlier in the seminar, but also things like pipelines and roads well pads, which are used more and more in Western Canada to extract oil sands in situ, peat extraction, which we've also heard about earlier today, and mining in order to extract a whole suite of resources from below ground and which peatlands are disturbed in the process. So in order to compute what the potential of these natural climate solutions from peatlands were in Canada, Scott and I set out to compile a a series of data sets. The first is a rate of new disturbance because we need to determine what's the potential area that will be disturbed into the future that we could avoid. An area of existing disturbance because that would inform us of how much area we actually have available to apply restoration on. And then the greenhouse gas emissions that are happening in natural peatlands, disturbed peatlands, so we can look at the difference if we avoid disturbance and then at restored sites so we can look at the benefit of restoration. So I'm not gonna have a ton of time to go into all the details of that compilation, but sort of to give the high level results and then some interesting, um, maybe surprising things we found along the way. So this is really like the punchline of, of this analysis and, and compiling everything together. This is what we've calculated as the potential for natural climate solutions attributed to peatlands in Canada. And as part of this process, any of these actions were taken over the next decade. So we either restored or avoided these areas within that 10 year period. And then we calculated the potential emission reductions to 2030 or cumulatively till 2050. And so if we put all of that together, we can see that we have the potential for up to 54 megatons of CO2 equivalent reductions by 2030. And a little over 150 by 2050. And the first take home message from this slide is that the vast majority of that comes from avoiding new disturbance. And this is like Lorna alluded to because of the fact that we still have quite a lot of pristine peatland in Canada and that some of these potential future disturbances are quite large. Also because when you avoid disturbance, you kind of get an immediate payback because the system is already functioning. And so you're just avoiding a shift. Restoration can be important in some situations, but we start to see that it really takes some time for those ecosystems to start acting as a carbon sink. And so we get much larger benefit if we look to 2050 than in the next decade. The other thing that we calculated was an annual potential in 2030. So this would be in one year. And the average value we have is we calculated was 10 megatons of CO2 equivalent in that year. 
put this in context, current greenhouse gas emissions in Canada are about 700 megatons of CO2 equivalent. So this is really only you know, 1% one, 1 maybe of our emissions. So definitely cannot be the solution alone, but one that would need to come with a suite of other actions on the landscape, as well as a massive reduction in fossil fuel use. The other thing I'll illustrate here is the massive error bars on that estimate from anywhere from peatlands potentially being bad for the climate and releasing additional greenhouse gases to being actually a very substantial source of, of emissions reductions. And these uncertainties come from the many knowledge gaps, some of which we've already heard about earlier today. And so one that may be surprising to some and not so surprising to others is that we don't have a really good national wetland map, particularly one that consistently maps classes across the country. This is something that many people know about. And for example, NRCAN is working hard to improve maps and to create national maps. Um, and I think we're gonna hear a bit more about mapping in the next presentation as well globally. But in the end, Scott and I went back to this relatively old map, which we also discovered has problems of its own. But maybe even more difficult is that we don't have a national inventory of disturbance areas. Uh, and actually the bigger problem is that we don't really know the trends in disturbance. And we have scarce data on the effects of many of these disturbance types on carbon stocks and greenhouse gas fluxes. And these latter two are really what comes into play from what Lorna was mentioning in managed land that we do a poor job of calculating it. And it's really because of these data gaps that we're not able to do it well in the country. The other thing that we came across are that particularly when we think about natural climate solutions on short timescales that we face some interesting trade-offs that we may not think about on first blush. So in general, we went into this project thinking that the more restoration we could do, the better. And in the end, several of those restoration pathways proved to actually be detrimental from a greenhouse gas perspective. So the first one that I'll, a uh, quick case study I'll do is seismic line restoration. And so Taylor already did a great job of introducing what seismic lines are, but here's just another photograph of what one of these looks like on the ground. And as she mentioned, these are really detrimental to caribou habitat, largely because of increases in predation. And so in the interest of caribou recovery plans, oil sands industry are embarking on large restoration activities on these lines. And the main method is mounding to create drier microsites for planting trees to close the canopy for caribou habitat. But some of the data, which is really the only data that we that you know any that anyone has at this point that we've collected shows that there is a loss of near surface soil carbon in during the construction of these lines. And that's why avoiding new construction is a really positive natural climate solution. But what we've also found is that mounding because of additional soil disturbance leads to additional carbon losses, at least in the short term. So while there is evidence that it reduces predator movement and improves tree growth, in the short term, it appears to be bad from a greenhouse gas perspective because of these large soil carbon losses. So while this may be different over longer timescales, when we're thinking about these as a stopgap measure for the next few decades, we're going to have to balance our decisions that we make on habitat potentially with these really interesting climate policy uh, frameworks. Similarly, we found something um, surprising when we looked at well pad restoration. So going in, we thought that restoring well pads again would sort of be a slam dunk for, for climate. And that's because you go from something that's basically a bare, barren landscape of, of mineral soil fill to something that looks like this. And this is a well pad that we've been working on restoring in near the Peace River region. But what why this doesn't really work out as we think is because of this long payback period to climate benefit associated with restoration. And to illustrate this, I'm gonna start first with an example that we know quite well, which is peat extraction. 
And I've just put a couple of pictures of peat extraction on the side here. We were moving from an extracted peatland here to one that's restored. So first, um, I'm showing here the net ecosystem exchange of CO2, where anything positive is a source of carbon to the atmosphere and anything negative is a sink. So if we extract peat and we do nothing to the site, it remains a source of carbon because that peat is decomposing. And over time, the total amount released declines, but it will remain for many decades of a source of carbon, um, even though this is sort of old recalcitrant carbon. If we restore a site, we know that we can relatively quickly within about 15 years, turn it back into a carbon sink. But in the first few years, we actually create an even larger carbon source as we introduce new plant material and we turn up the soil. And so it actually takes until the site is about 69 years old for this small carbon sink that we create to balance out all of the carbon emissions in this early period. But you don't need to be a net sink to be a natural climate solution. You just need to be better than doing nothing. And so because the unrestored site is a huge source of CO2, restoring the site provides a climate benefit already two years post restoration. And this is why it's such an important natural climate solution. A slightly different scenario happens though when we think about well pads because that peat under the well pad probably isn't decomposing very quickly. It's been buried in saturated conditions and we've basically put a cap on top of it with that well pad. So to the best that we could discern, Scott and I would assign a value of zero greenhouse gas emissions while the well pad is in place. So presumably if we do nothing, it just remains uh, you know, sort of carbon neutral. If however, we peel back that well pad for restoration, we have some evidence that suggests it follows a very similar trajectory to this restored site. So instead of being carbon neutral for the first decade, you create a large carbon source. And again, it takes until about 70 years later before you start to see a climate benefit. So at least if we make decisions based on greenhouse gas emissions alone, this may suggest that we should leave the well pads in place, which is maybe putting us in a very interesting uh, position uh, when trying to decide what we should do with restoration. But the trick here is we really don't know what happens to that organic matter under a well pad. No one's measured that. And we don't know what happens to the greenhouse, gas uh, greenhouse gases that are produced while it's in place or what happens when we peel it off. So before we know that, it makes it very difficult to make these types of decisions. So to conclude, we determined that peatlands could offer natural climate solutions of about 150 megatons of CO2 equivalent by 2050. And this largely arises from avoided disturbance. There are many knowledge gaps uh, related to this calculation. And this reminds us of the old adage that we can't manage what we don't measure. And while natural climate solutions are often discussed with the many co-benefits that they provide, at least when we think on short time scales, there may actually be some interesting trade-offs between different ecosystem services um, that we might want to attain. So thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Great, thanks, Maria. And yeah, we've got a couple of questions, I think. So I see that there's one here. Do you think it would be feasible to make a peatland ombrotrophic on top of the well pad, keeping the older carbon intact, but returning some functionality to the landscape? Yeah, so that's actually something we've been working on and could be whether we can make it ombotrophic is probably not in the short term, but there have been some really good outcomes of actually um, getting fen vegetation to grow back on top of fill. So you just sort of scrape the fill down to a level where you get some hydrologic connection with the adjacent peatland and then you could start to get peat formation on top of that again. So that may be a good option moving forward. Um, but we really have no data because it's sort of really early days on that. Uh, 
All right, Maria, another question for you. What do governments primarily have to do to ensure that protection is provided? What are impediments for Canadian scientists? Um, I'm assuming he's asking, I guess, about protection I think of so. the peatlands. Um, I guess maybe one of the biggest difficulties here is that wetlands are largely provincially managed and mapped. Um, they do fall under the forest management when we think across Canada, which is why NRCAN has been doing a lot of work here. But because a lot of these development decisions are made at provincial levels and then the accounting is done at national levels, this is why some of these knowledge gaps are arising. Um, so it's really, yeah, I think working across those levels of government. And I think that's even going to be the sort of maybe biggest stumbling block to a pan-Canadian peatland strategy, like Lorna mentioned, is really how to work within the sort of policy context that we're that we sit in in the country. Great, thanks, Maria. And we are ready to move on to keep on schedule for our final talk today. Thanks a lot, Maria. And our final talk is Joe Melton from Environment and Climate Change Canada. So welcome, Joe, and happy to have you with us for your presentation today. Okay, thank you. All right, so hopefully that came up okay. Um, yeah, thanks for organizing this and, and keeping it going. Um, my stuff is going to be a little bit different. I, I'm going to be going global, and it's going to be quite preliminary. <laughs> so hopefully people find it interesting. Uh, so I work with the, the Canadian Land Surface Scheme, including biogeochemical cycles. Uh, a former version of this model uh, was the CLASS CTEM coupled framework. Uh, CLASS, of course, is the Canadian Land Surface Scheme, and CTEM is the Canadian Terrestrial Ecosystem Model. Um, these are fairly comprehensive models. Uh, you can see here is a lot of processes of policy lights. Um, we've recently um, done some work to make it into more open source community model and rebrand it as Classic. Now, Classic does have the capability of simulating peatlands. Um, peatlands were brought in uh, at around 2016. And what the peatland module does is we have uh, a peat column and then there's some photosynthetic moss on top and you have uh, different plant functional types that are associated to peatlands. And uh, in the paper where we introduced this module, um, we had done it at several of these sites, um, uh, except for a Scotty Creek here, just the one that I've been uh, adding to it. And so we've been interested to use this capability uh, globally in our Earth system models. Um, but we do have one problem is that uh, we need some way to say, okay, this is where peatlands are. And it's of course too costly to map the whole globe. Um, so you can look around and try and find um, what people have been producing. And there's this one called peat map. It's probably the best global map of peatland area. Uh, but the problem is, is that most of the regions in it are not actually um, a fractional cover. They're more like a polygon. So stuff like, uh, you know, problems become a lot more uh, evident when you look up in regions like this, these larger areas instead of peatlands. And of course, there's more heterogeneity that would be occurring in, in these locations. Um, and so to simulate gold peatlands, we're kind of looking for something along the lines of a fractional coverage. Um, Canada actually has that, and that's what, what's, uh, what's here in PMAP. Um, even though I, it does have its own problems. So um, there was a nice uh, digital mapping of peatlands review done by Manassan here. And you know, this kind of gives an idea that you, 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 know, you can predict peatland fractional cover because we generally understand what, um, what causes them to form you know, up here in his dominant drivers on the scales that we're looking at, um, kind of regional and global. And you can then look trying to see for that those dominant drivers are there some sort of indicators that you can use that would uh, suggest that this is an area where peatland can form. And so based on that, the idea that we have is to use machine learning techniques to uh, train an algorithm using known private peatland cover, then allow it to find relationships within these indicators or often called features 
and you can generate predictions, which would be then your, your global peatland cover map. So we started doing this. And the first thing you need to do then is if have some kind of training data. Basically, um, we needed some locations where we know peatlands are. Um, I've got several of them here. Some of them are rather large areas. Of course, Canada has a very large uh, peatland cover. We've got more on the west side of the region. We've also got a few small countries like Scotland or Ireland and Netherlands. Um, in each of these, we tried to choose them because they at least have some ground truthing been done to them. There actually is a lot of maps you can look for that have no ground truthing uh, applied whatsoever. Um, so this is where the, we know peatlands are, but if you just train them all on this, it tends to then uh, try and put a lot of peatlands in areas that are really not conducive of it because it's trying to understand based on what it sees in these locations. Um, so we also have chosen to tell it where we know peatlands aren't. And so to do that, we said that deserts and xeric shrublands uh, from these eco regions map of Olson, uh, there's not going to be peatlands there, so there's no there. So that's our training data. And we also then need to look at our features or indicators. And so these again broadly from these general class of climate, soils, vegetation, topography. And um, we've chosen to use ones that have a high spatial resolution, but also seem to be of high quality. Um, there's a terra climate data set here, which several of these are um, things that actually can be observed, whereas some of them are derived products. Um, like, for example, um, the, the Pomodoro Severity Index. And for soils, these open land maps. Uh, these are actually machine learning products where they've used a lot of um, measurements and then they use the machine learning to kind of fill in the gaps. Uh, vegetation, a lot of remote sense products. Um, here, trying to explain what is the vegetation you're doing. Um, Unfortunately, the, the Palsar one, which you think would indicate uh, water quite well, because it's, it's been processed, it's actually reduced some of the sensitivity to uh, water um, that we were hoping for, um, just because they were interested in more uh, forest cover, actually. And the last one is a uh, very large, uh, very nice geomorphology um, data set that gives a lot of different aspects of how the land surface is changing. So we then took all that information of our training data and our features and we put them into a machine learning algorithm called Light GBM. Uh, it's a decision tree algorithm. So it's kind of like random forest, which I think is uh, relatively well known, um, but it, do it does apply some gradient boosting. Um, so what it does is it produces uh, an ensemble of what you can call like weak learners in that like the tree is not allowed to grow, it, they try to limit it. And then after each tree has been trained, it then the next learner um, tries to learn from the mistakes of the previous one. And so they go along in sequence like that. And you combine, and you get a single strong learner. Uh, the nice thing about this uh, particular algorithm is it's very efficient and it seems to have very high accuracy to um, similar to XGBoost, which is one that often seems to win a lot of these machine learning uh, competitions. Uh, we applied this on a five arc minute global grid. And um, so here's some preliminary results. Uh, this is, uh, of course, peat map again, and this is some of our earlier results. And you, you know, these maps you can't really see much, so let's just look a little bit more into regions. Um, so here's uh, Canada. This is a predicted and mapped on the top. And look fairly reasonable. Of course, this is not surprising because um, the model has been trained to try and reproduce Canada. So that one's not uh, that different. Um, however, if you look at Russia here, um, these are the areas that he was used for training and that prediction, of course, to some null states down here. And if you look at the peat map, um, unfortunately, the projections aren't going to hit time to plot peat maps. Um, but you can see that there's definitely supposed to be some peatlands in this area, which is somewhat kind of comforting. Um, looking down at Tasmania and New Zealand, we seem to get this, um, uh, again, these are the mapped versus the predicted amount. We get some similarities, however, we seem to miss out on some highest points uh, in New Zealand um, that our models are able to capture. And then looking at uh, South America, again, we only had one uh, peatland complex in South America, but we are able to capture this area that the model wasn't trained on that is seen in peat map. So that's nice to see. However, we also get this region down here that I think is um, kind of getting into the Chaco, which peat map can have. I mean, peat map, of course, is not truth. Um, but we do like to see some agreement. And also that chakra region, I think, is, is unlikely to have peatlands, but we'll see. 
Um, so what are the top features then? What are the things that the model thought were important when it was trying to find this? Um, you can look at this by gain and by split. So gain is, is some like the, the information that it believes it's, it's gaining from using that parameter. Um, and split is like how many different decision tree splits is it used in? So they are different ways to look at the top features. Um, by gain, it seems to be the geomorphological landform. And so here's some example ones that were in the data set, like uh, pits, flat areas, peaks, et cetera. Um, and also NDVI. So those are the dominant two by gain by a large margin. However, if you look at by split, it's much more even. However, by split, um, sometimes you think that some of these are probably coming in by overfitting where the, um, the algorithm just trying to use uh, the feature to try and help improve its scoring. Um, I would say that these top features are just very likely to change. I mean, we're, we're redoing how we've done the, the climate variables because the way we've done it right now is probably too simplistic. And also the way we've tried to select the most important or most powerful features uh, has also probably not been well done yet because um, we have to trim down from like 140 possible ones that we had at present. We've trimmed that down a lot because otherwise, again, you have real problems with overfitting. Um, so how do we check if we have overfitting? Well, you have to do some sort of cross-validation. Uh, we've chosen to do here is a block, leave one out. Um, this is just the first try at it. What I've done is I've just taken uh, I need different uh, regions here of latitude lands. And do, for example, to do the, the block even up on uh, this section A, you train model on sections B through I, and then you try and predict the distribution in section A. And so you can do that for all of them, and you can see what you get. And some of these, I mean, they're OK, uh, actually, they, like, for example, B. Uh, and F are fairly reasonable, R squared is 0.8. Um, but some of it just completely falls down on like your D is uh, got an R squared of 0.3 and it doesn't look like it has much predictive ability at all. Um, so what are we looking for? I mean, I don't really know exactly what I'm wanting in the end, but like MODIS, uh, LA products have an R squared of 0.77. Uh, and you can tell ours that we're likely overfitting at the moment because if you take um, our total, like our all regions, um, R squared right now, it's about 0.64, you can see down here. But if you just take our full model value, it's 0.87. So the fact that they're not matching is indicating that there's probably some overfitting. But there's some hyperparameters in the algorithm that can help limit this um, and, and be used as a way to try and prevent overfitting from causing problems while still increasing the accuracy. Um, so this is like a really fast rundown of what we've been working on. but um, we have a peatland module, of course, uh, in Classic, and we require a global peatland map. Um, there's not really a present one that exists that's suitable, so we're trying to use machine learning to produce a map. And it will give us some reasonable estimate of its uncertain, or estimate of its uncertainty, so that's good. To good. And I think that these early results show promise. Um, they're by no means polished yet. Um, with further work, we're going to try and refine uh, both the, the features used um, and how we're selecting them. Uh, also refine, refine the cross-validation regions for our block leave one out. Uh, I'm going to use uh, Bayesian hyperparameter optimization to try and increase the accuracy while making sure we don't have overfitting. Uh, and then I'll, of course, later start to compare against peat map or other areas where we can have some good fractional information to check that over. So uh, that's me. Thanks. Great, thanks, Joe. And I see some questions coming in. So the first one, have you thought about predicting peatland probability from satellite images directly, or maybe add them as one of your indicators? I, I, uh, I'm not sure, like, I'm not, I'm not sure entirely what, what we could use as a direct indicator of peatland area. I'm, I'm, you know, there's some, my understanding is just, there's some remotely sensed information that would obviously be better for this, but I don't believe you could do it from just satellite imagery alone. Um, there have been um, ones where people have taken very high resolution satellite imagery and used it in a similar fashion to what we've done, um, but then uh, processing of the satellite imagery becomes very uh, challenging and becomes a very large obstacle. We're trying to use it as much as possible pre-processed satellite imagery to do not have to do all of the ortho-rectifying, stripe removals, et cetera, ourselves. 
because I mean, really my whole goal is to make it so I can run my model over this. I'm not necessarily somebody whose entire purpose is to produce a P-line cover map for another reason, so. Right. Okay, uh, next question for you. Peat map didn't seem to identify peat lands that are known to exist in Japan. Did your model find these? <laughs> I'd have to look closer, that's a good point. Um, one of the problems with peat map, of course, is it's just a, it's just a, um, it's just a, like a, they, well, they, they called it a meta-analysis, but they've just taken existing maps and kind of plunked them all in together. And for example, in Hokkaido, it's actually just a map of histocells. So it's, it's just um, coming from a soil data set. Um, so it's not, and then and that's actually why we're actually wanting to not use it is because we feel that it, it is limited. But I, I actually, thanks for the question about Japan. I'll have a look with my results because I haven't actually plotted them up uh, for that area at, at closer resolution. And a question about your use of fractional coverage instead of a high resolution binary P or no P map, what are the pros and cons of each approach? Uh, oh, okay. Well, right now, actually, we're, we are right now producing uh, basically a high resolution binary because it's a five arc minute grid. And then from that, we'll back out to a fractional cover map at the resolution of their system model or of our offline model. Um, which is, I mean, it becomes quite a bit larger. It's, you know, we're, we're going to be at one degree for our offline model, but the Earth system model's grid is, is still quite large. And so we're, we're basically going to back out to that. Okay, and a new, another question about your validation method. Can you com comment on the model's performance? Uh, well, I, I would suggest that right now, I mean, I, I, I think that we are probably overfitting. I mean, using this block, leave one out, um, the idea we're, we're with it is that we're trying to um, prevent ourselves from producing an overly optimistic error estimate. And so, um, and actually, if, if Michelle's on the call, uh, we had like uh, quite a few years ago had done earlier work on this. And one of the comments though is, is that, oh, you know, you, you can't do a random holdout of, of your training versus your evaluation data set. So we're trying to use this block leap one out as a way to um, ensure that our error estimate is, is, is accurate. And I think that, um, you know, I, I honestly, I, because this is so early, I, I don't really, not really worried about the results. But I think it's it's quite interesting for me to try and understand, like, you know, why do I have, you know, certain rubber blocks being quite poor, or other ones I, I would say are actually fairly acceptable. So it's it's going to be what's going to help lead our development of this to um, to further improve it. And and in the end, I'm hoping that my full model versus my cross validation um, R squares will will start to become uh, closer, which would indicate. I hope that there's less less likely or that we have overfitting. Okay, and I see one other question. Maybe this will be our last question. Uh, for your cross-validation, did you consider a random subset of training data versus the longitudinal split? Oh, okay. So that, that yeah, that kind of relates to what I was just mentioning. Um, and no, uh, we did well, we didn't because we had done that. Um, again, like an early version of this work was done back when there was a postdoc who was able to do it. Um, and she since went on to the financial sector and um, I've taken this on then to try and get it completed because we still have this need. And we had done the random holdout, but the problem with the random holdout is you tend to have an overly optimistic um, uh, uh, measure of your uncertainty. Actually, it would be kind of interesting just to do that again, to see how much different my my block leave one out versus the random holdout is. is I, my, my belief right now is that it's gonna be um, too optimistic when I do the random holdout. I've actually done some ones with this where I've allowed the algorithm to choose like a tenfold cross validation. And I, even that I find the cross validation is a little more optimistic than my present um, setup. Um, though I'm not saying that what I have now is perfect, but it's, it seems to be a, a very, um, or a more uh, conservative way of estimating my error. Okay, great. All right, so thanks, Joe. And that brings us to the end of our time together today. 
So I just want to once again thank all of our presenters. It was a great, great session. Lots of uh, in interesting information shared. So that's great to see. And uh, also to all of you that took time out of your day to present, uh, pardon me, to attend our presentations and, and support these presenters and ask them questions. Uh, I know it's all, always a bit of a challenge when you're presenting to your computer and it's good to see that we had such a large, large group here uh, interested in the work. Um, thanks again to our student coordinators for helping to make this happen and, and getting this all organized. And I will just put a final reminder in for next week. Next week, we have a series of talks from several of the hydrology section sessions. So if that's not in your calendar already uh, and that interests you, then please join us in a week's time. Thanks everyone, and we'll see you all again at a future session.